has served as a vantage point and place of royalty. It has seen the tumultuous rise and fall of our fortunes. But it would also provide us with a life-giving element for centuries. One that would also cause much grief for the people living here in time to come. Once this was the seat of power, the resting place of pioneers and people of faith. It's a memory landmark of our childhood years and of our lives in modern times. The hill has seen all of the major events that shaped us into who we are today. From here, we can tell seven centuries of our story, our history from the hills. This is a story about one of the most important resources that the hill has provided the people of Singapore for centuries. Here at the National Archives building near the foot of Fort Canning, archaeologist and historian Professor Lim Chun Sien is on the search for something that used to be a prominent feature on the hill more than 700 years ago. Lim Chun Sien has been involved in some of the earliest excavations on the island, including the ones on Fort Canning. These excavations have unearthed close to half a million artifacts that tell the story of ancient Singapore. So for our case, while well, we're searching for um, uh, evidence of the old uh, spring or, or groundwater source at Fort Canning or the foot of Fort Canning, uh, I suspect that some of these plants would feature very prominently the different wells the British uh, military or British uh, municipal authorities sank into the area because they want to tap into that pool of water by Fort Canning. So hopefully we can find that and you might get enough details to show you uh, this aspect of our query. Aha! All these wells, or water source, or sources, tanks, you know, the water tanks, are really toward on the foot of uh, Fort Canning. And what we have here, even in 1921, they're still accessing these water source, the well where today is the, or formerly was the River Valley swimming pool. So here we are. Um, there are definitely lots of uh, large amount of groundwater there for them to tap. You know? And at least these maps have demonstrated that uh, over a 50 year span, there was sufficient uh, groundwater source for them to tap into, because the you know, wells do dry out. So there must be a quite a large uh, water reservoir underneath, a natural water reservoir. 14th century Singapore, or Tamase as it was called, was founded around the mouth of the Singapore River due to the nearby presence of a freshwater supply and a hill. The abundant supply of fresh water came from a spring on Fort Canning Slope that served as a bathing place for royalty and also a source of fresh water for the people. This spring was still supplying ships and the population with fresh water before eventually going dry in 1830. Here at the south side of the foothills and close to Clark Quay, Professor Lim is about to show us the exact location of the elusive source of this spring. Ah, this is the source of life. The so-called Forbidden Spring of Singapore, uh, Panchu Lalarangan, Forbidden Spring. I know it's just a grass patch right now, but some of you viewers and people will remember back in the 80s, it used to be River Valley Swimming Pool, and of course water. 700 years before that, this was so the so-called Forbidden Spring. The ancient royalty and princesses used to bathe in this pool of water. If we were to venture to guess how the ancient bathing pool or spring would be like, and if we were to really to believe that the royalty bathed there, uh, the, the little pool itself would have been very elaborate. Probably it would be lined by bricks, uh, mud brick or whatever, uh, and, and there will be possibly quite intricate carvings. 500 years after the fall of ancient Masse, another group of people came. In 1819, as the Stanford Raffles and Colonel William Farquhar landed on the shores of Singapore, the presence of this all-important source of water would prove crucial to their plans of eventually developing a trading port here. When the British first arrived, they were looking for water. 
not just as a trade sediment, they need water. Ships need water, people need water, they need to shower, they need to bathe, they need to eat. So water is essence, right? Of course, the first sediment that they found at Karamun Islands today of Indonesia, they were looking for it and they said, well, there's not enough water. The water was brackish, it's not great water. So hence, Raffles or Stanford Raffles decided that's not a great uh, potential to set up a new sediment and they came over to Singapore. Because most of the river mouths in Straits of Malacca area are very brackish. Um, even though there's a fresh water coming downstream, it mixes a lot because of the tides. You get ocean water going upstream when the tide goes up. And so um, a lot of that water is not drinkable, even though it's in an estuary, but still it's too salty. So here you had uh, really good, totally pure water coming out the side of the hill. The British, when they arrived, also mentioned this. Later, they would sink lots of little wells to, um, to provide water for visiting ships or to sell them to, uh, for visiting ships. There were many wells uh, established when, when Singapore was founded under East Indian Company. And even before the English or uh, the East India Company uh, uh, fellows came over Singapore to set up this little port, uh, the local inhabitants had to have drinking water, had to have some sort of water supply. So there were wells. Uh, Typically, most of these uh, 19th century type of, uh, of uh, establishments, they have two types of wells. One is for drinking, and the other one is for washing and cooking and whatnot. So it's a utility in that sense, you know, for daily use. Um, wells would have been dotted um, throughout this entire area. Well, some could be military-owned because this was military installation. Some were, of course, owned by civilians. Uh, there were already people setting up shop along Singapore River and here of Clark Key and stuff. All these little warehouses and shop house or little, little attached uh, shop fronts would have their own wells to draw water. And the British would eventually establish some of the greatest engineering projects ever conceived in the history of early Singapore. Just within the vicinity of Fort Canning Hill lies a road that bears witness to the importance of fresh water on the hill. Originally located along Clemenceau Avenue, this stretch of road just west of Fort Canning Hill and connected to River Valley Road was called Tank Road until 1919, named for the water storage tanks that existed in the area. To the northwest of uh, Fort Canning Hill today is a little road that's known as Tank Road, right? And well, it's called Tank Road because there were these water storage tanks. So they had these big tanks built there. There were wells dug there. We have very good ample cartographic uh, evidence, archival evidence to show that, you know, there were little wells and things. The place called Tank Road. And this tank is associated with water tank for the steam locomotives to store water. Okay, but that spot is also very interesting because if it goes back to 19th, uh, 14th century, that is the place which is always associated with water. So they discovered this fresh water supply or you know, groundwater supply to the west of the foot of Fort Canning. Uh, that's just a few hundred meters or maybe even less than that uh, to Singapore River. And they realized that you know, this water is it's, it's a revenue source. They built a little aqueduct. Uh, we don't really know how it looked like the aqueduct. There's no evidence of it, but there's at least historical records, documented records say that the aqueduct was built uh, from the foot of Fort Canning, going down to the Singapore River, where people can literally roll up the little boats and fill up the cast of water and pay for it. So they're selling this water for the ships that are passing by. Singapore 1920s. The ancient spring has finally dried up after centuries of sustaining the inhabitants of the island. But deep beneath the hill, there lies a symbol of how important this life-giving element is to the booming population. Built in 1926, the Fort Canning Service Reservoir was constructed on the former site of a large artillery barracks and parade ground to help supplement the large impounding reservoirs. Water is pumped from the large reservoirs to Fort Canning, enabling it to flow down the hill and into the houses. The main purpose of building the reservoir at Fort Canning Hill was to provide the military with its own dedicated, uh, isolated, uh, directly controlled source of water for all of the obvious purposes for domestic as well as uh, practical use, including uh, obvious things such as bathing and consumption. 
It wasn't meant in any way to be part of the general reserve that would help meet the water needs of the entire human population of the city or of the island. It was too small for that. Uh, obviously, in a great pinch, it could be thrown into the mix. It was physically connected to the water distribution grid. It had to be. But its primary purpose was to provide a, a dedicated, specific, military-controlled, uh, protected source of water. Our reliance on water would be crucial in another stage of history. It would be one of the most important factors that determine our fate during the dark days of World War II. Deep inside Fort Canning Hill and near to the reservoir lies a hidden bunker that tells us some of the secrets of the battle for Singapore. Originally built as a wireless relay station, it was used as the headquarters of the Allied forces from the 11th of February 1942, just four days before the surrender. What went on between General Percival and the other commanders here during the last days of the battle would change the course of our history. One of the reasons behind the eventual surrender was the fact that as the battle raged on in February 1942, the island had only two weeks' worth of water left to survive. One of the things that the Japanese were doing to try and speed up their victory as much as possible, to reduce their own losses and to bring the battle to an end as quickly as they could, they were turning their firepower on Singapore. They were bombing it relentlessly from the air and they were shelling it heavily with their artillery, and this was indiscriminate. They were literally just pouring metal into the area that the defenders still held hoping to break the resistance psychologically and physically. As a result of all that metal flying around, it was punching a lot of holes in the pipes, particularly the main pipe distribution network that brought the water from the reservoirs. Here in a house in Adam Park, a team of specialists are busy trying to recreate what happened here more than 70 years ago in this seemingly serene neighborhood that lies close to the Ritchie Reservoir. They do this by literally digging up the past. Oh, that's a bit fragile. At least you can see the dimensions of it. John Cooper is a battlefield archaeologist. What he and his team found in Adam Park would amount to thousands of Allied and Japanese artifacts ranging from live rounds, unit insignias, utensils and personal items. This show a telling picture of what happened around the area during World War II. Yeah, so the, um, the question we've got to really ask about this, this thing is we're getting water bottles, and uh, water bottles are imperative. It's an important bit of kit, especially in this climate, for a soldier to have the water bottle. To lose it, I mean, we found two in this hole, so why did the owner not want his water bottle anymore? Uh, was he wounded or killed or did they have too many or what was he doing to warrant throwing damn good water bottle in the hole and why didn't somebody pick it up at a later date? That's another, another thing we have to think about. One of his recent finds around the area tells us of the importance of water during these troubled times. It's an enameled World War II British canteen but that, after 70 years in the ground, is in remarkable condition. In fact, when we took it out of the ground, it still had water. The water had collected inside, so it wasn't seeping away. Most notably at Adam Park on the 15th of February 1942, as the surrender was just about to take place, chugging up the road came a water bowser. And, um, and all the lads looked out and saw that and thought, wow, you know, this guy's brave just to bring this water up to the front line for, for us. By the time he got it, the, the vehicle up from Bucket Timor up to Adam Park, it was riddled with bullets and the water was gushing out of the holes on the, either side. And the lads had to rush out and fill up their water cans before the water had run out completely. So it just gives uh, you a sense of how important how water was and people were willing to risk their lives getting the water up to the frontline troops. Water would be crucial in saving many lives during the last days of the battle and not just for personal consumption. So here we are in a, this urban environment and we've got international schools up there, a country club up there, we've got a busy housing estate on the far side of the road and in such an environment it may be difficult to find out exactly what relates to World War II. 
but I'm going to show you something now which was very important during the fighting. See if we can find it. So here it is, the water pipeline, the pipeline that's mentioned in most of the diaries in 1942. May not be the original pipes, but certainly it's standing on the original platforms. The pipeline itself almost cuts the island in half and it's a direct route into town. It's no wonder that the Japanese aircraft could spot this thing from the air, orientate themselves off the reservoirs and the pipeline and head on into town. It's a big feature. Just by its dimensions you, and how impressive the build is itself, you can see how much effort has been put into bringing water down into the city from Johor. These pipes found along Jalan Kampong Chante in the Bukatima area were important lifelines for the Allied troops during the war. During World War II, many Allied troops would make good their escape by following the pipelines back towards the city centre. Many of these pipes lead to our main water catchment areas. Some were even used to transport water to the service reservoir at Fort Canning. As time went on, other stories of water found around Fort Canning would shape many of our memories in a very different way. During the 1950s, there lies a building on Fort Canning Hill that used the idea of water in a somewhat enterprising way. Built in 1955, the Van Cleef Aquarium was Singapore's first public aquarium. It had its own water supply and was home to more than 6,000 marine animals from 180 species. More than 150,000 people visited the aquarium within the first three months of its opening. It was named after Dutch businessman Carl William Benjamin Van Cleef, who had donated a large sum of money to the government upon his death. An aquarium was eventually constructed on the hillside facing River Valley Road in his name, as it had significant scientific, educational and commercial value. Kevin Koo works at the National Archives of Singapore and has been researching and documenting the history of the Van Cleef Aquarium. The only chance you can get to see living and moving creatures in their authentic environments, right, is, is maybe at that was true through places like the aquarium. So we brought uh, important visitors to the aquarium, our government. So this is the, the Agung of Malaysia in 1963. This is uh, Madam Teng Xiaoping when she visited in the late 70s with Aspen. The Van Cleef Aquarium at Fort Canning Hill was an important attraction even up till the 1980s when major restoration works began to upgrade the structures and exhibits. It would also help form many memories for thousands of Singaporeans as they were growing up. My earliest memory of Fort Canning would have been as a child going to Van Cleef Aquarium. Fish tanks, in any case, always fascinates any child, right? So I, I was one that was kind of fascinated. Um, it was somewhere that I would sometimes bug my father to bring me to. And you, you had to go up the stairs at one end, went through the dark building where you had a lot of fish tanks, and then came down from the other side. It was kind of dark. You know, you walk through this uh, set of tanks, and it's kind of dark, and the tanks were... You know, you could see uh, very strange looking fish. Uh, I remember, I think lionfish, um, seahorses, very distinctly, I remember seahorses. It was tanks and we were just excited just to see the fishes, you know, in the tanks. But I can tell you for sure that uh, during my school days, especially when we were in pre that was a very good place to, uh, for dating. The kids were very excited when they saw the fishes swimming around, eh? Yeah. And uh, of course, when they are out of the aquarium, they like to play and uh, my kids will be jumping, you know, the step from one step to another and then they'll climb on the stone bench and play around. Eh? But still, as a young child, that was the place to go to. Blogger Philip Chu retraces the aquarium from memory.
at the construction site formerly was Bank Cave Aquarium. Now they are building Fort Canning Station, uh, downtown lines. I think the Bank Cave Aquarium is somewhere, somewhere there. And the uh, National Theatre is further away on the left. But both are facing the National Avenue here. Down in front of the building, a uh, few steps down, there was a playing field for kids. Uh, quite, quite a big area so that the kids can run around here and uh, also a few concrete benches where they can sit down. As new attractions sprung up around the island, the aquarium finally closed its doors in 1991 after a four-year legacy of entertaining the locals and tourists alike. The peak of the aquarium was really in 1979 to 80, where they were drawing in about 400,000 people every year. And then suddenly by the mid-80s, by 1985, you were, uh, the numbers had fallen to about 250,000. So there's the, uh, the various efforts to rejuvenate the, the aquarium, renovate it. But um, one thing, one thing we figured was that um, the the growing there were compete growing number of competing attractions appearing at the time. You had the Singapore Zoo, uh, you had the bird park, uh, and then the the killer one was in the 90s uh, when Underwater World appeared in Sentosa, and that really really um, um, made it very difficult for the aquarium to continue lah. The story of water on Fort Canning Hill spans across many of our ups and downs in history. The hill has nourished the people for centuries and has provided a prime vantage point for us. And as time went on, it would also become a place where we remember our own happy childhood memories. But dark clouds were on the horizon. As we backtrack to the 1940s, Fort Canning Hill would prove to be a significant landmark as the island and its inhabitants are plunged headlong into World War II.